Uh, my father's interest in music made him join the army because it seemed the only way he could get uh, tuition in playing the violin and the saxophone. And then at the end of the war, he formed a big band in Manchester and he became a band leader with the Ted Astley Orchestra who's played at um, um, do, 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 so South Manchester way. And, um, and then he got a call, and he used to do band big band arrangements for quite a few people. Um, then he got a call from Francis Dane Hunter, who were a big music publishers in, uh, in London at the time. They've been taken over by EMI since. And, um, and he was asked to come down and work in London full time for these music publishers and to do uh, what's well, really to knock out arrangements more than anything. And um, it was a big decision, but he decided to do it. And I'd been born, and my sister had been born in Manchester, so we all came, the two of us came down with him. And, uh, and we lived in um, North London, out um, near Harrow. And uh, he commuted into town, and he, he worked in a room with uh, three other p pianos, <laughs> which must have been madness. Um, so he, uh, but he could, he could write from his head anyway, so he didn't actually need a piano. He's always had that ability to be able to score from his head to paper. And, um, and after a short while of working there, it wasn't very long before he got asked to do um, some, write some music and score um, the new Robin Hood series that was being made. And although he didn't write Robin Hood, Robin Hood riding through the Glen that we all know, um, he did write the, um, the fanfare, which is very famous, and he did all the background music at the time as well. Very soon after that, he got asked to do uh, The Buccaneer, uh, which is a great series. And there was a, an early um, Roger Moore series, wasn't there? Ivanhoe, um, which he also did. And he got so busy at that time, actually, he had to... Um, that he got uh, a couple of other writers to fill in doing background music for Robin Hood, uh, Albert Elms, and I think someone else had to help him out, because it, it, um, suddenly he was snowed under with an incredible amount of work. And uh, these were actually all being made in North London at the time, which is quite close to where we lived, at, um, either at Elstree or Boreham Wood. Sometimes at Pinewood they'd be filming. But mostly the, the swashbucklers, I think, were made um, Elstree and Boreham Wood. I think it must have been the tank at Pinewood he told me about, which because um, there were sort of miniature versions of the ships that um, that were being filmed for Buccaneers, and uh, and I, I believe he met um, Robert Shaw, um, and they seemed to get on very well. Probably had a few a few drinks together, no doubt. Anyway, soon after that, um, he got asked to do the Monty Berman the Bright. I came into the picture much more, and, and was planning the Saint series with Roger Moore. He'd been uh, working on Ivanhoe, and naturally enough, my father was asked to do the music for that, which became very, very big and very famous. After he'd recorded, and it actually, the I think the first series had gone out, Leslie Charteris had wanted um, part of the theme for himself. So my father had to go and visit Leslie Charteris, and um, I don't want to get into sort of dodgy, dodgy waters here, but Leslie Charteris basically sang him a little line which was um, da -dee, da -da 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 -da, which I, th I think my father immediately noticed had been stolen from some other song. And, um, and he had to write this into the little bit in the middle of the Saints so that Leslie Charteris could uh, claim his royalties. I'm afraid it goes on, this sort of thing, but what the hell. It's, it's, it did him proud in the end, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the first recording was actually quite atrocious. It's um, it's so distorted, and <laughs> I think that, you know um, the uh, when they decided to reshoot, you know, reshoot a new series, then the option was there to re-record a theme and and to get the balance a little bit better, maybe. It was a girl's voice and a flute and something else. I think that actually in unison that played the do 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 do, um, and to get that nice and happening and without it being distorted um, probably didn't happen until the third series, I think. 
I've got a recording of the first one, and it, it, you wouldn't believe how horrible it's. It's kind of like all 2K, and there's no, just completely squashed and distorted. Mm. The number of people in sessions depended on um, very much whether it was going to be a theme tune or it was going to be background music. He often scored for about just a small tw 12 people maybe for background music. Or even in the, um, with Danger Man he might be using um, bass, drums, harpsichord and a little bit of brass or something. It was, it was quite minor for these kind of walking sneaky sequences that you see in Danger Man. And he'd use the harpsichord theme played in hundreds of different ways um, just to just to for the um, to get the mood of what what was going on at the time For a theme tune, I suppose the um, it would get probably get quite big. I was there at the recording for the Danger Man theme, and uh, it was a very exciting day because um, the harpsichord player, my father said, uh, had written the top line, which was a dum dum da and um, this is of course the second Danger Man series, not the first, and. Um, and he wanted a kind of boogie woogie theme sort of feel to it, but he hadn't actually written the left hand. So he sat down with the harpsichord player and said, because they'd never really done a boogie woogie on a harpsichord before, it had never been heard. And, um, and the harpsichord player kind of went, came up with this. And, and, then, and they both said, oh, that's good, that's going to work really well. So there was, there again, it's, you know, it's, it's lots of people contributing to, to the final thing, which was great. And, and it was very exciting. There was probably about 20 players, I think, on that session. And, and I remember the, uh, the, the producer was there, um, and he got very excited. He just thought it was a fabulous thing. And um, I think he said to me, you should be very proud of your father <laughs> while he was down on the floor. You know. Although um, my dad saw uh, Roger Moore socially in, in Stanmore, because they both lived in Stanmore, and he was married to Rosemary Clooney, I think, at the time. So we did see a little bit of Roger Moore. We didn't see Pat McGoon socially, but my dad did see Pat McGoon at Elstree, or Borehamwood. They met and joked and talked about things. And, of course, on a film set like that, where you had a, um, a film s stage, where the actual shooting was being taken place, there was a sound stage where the recording was taking place. And they were probably you know, a hundred yards apart within the studio, but everybody, of course, would meet for lunch if they were working through a day, and he, no doubt he sat and had lunch with Pat McGoon. They did talk about cars together. <laughs> I know that because um, my father turned up with a brand new Mercedes in 65, and, um, and Pat, was, Pat McGoon was very taken with it, and there's a, a lovely photograph and, uh, of them talking about the car and, uh, and actually that afternoon when my father had turned up very proudly with his brand new car I don't know if it, if it was Pat McGoon but somebody put him up to it and uh, my father came out and someone had scraped all along the side of the car my dad was nearly in tears at this, well he probably was in tears 
And then someone came out with an oily rag and just wiped it off because some of the uh, the scenery painters had, had put a lovely little line along with this car with bits of rust and coloured bits of flake and uh, it was a lovely job. <laughs> and I remember my father coming home and telling me about it, which was quite great. Now later, of course, um, Pat McGoon asked, um, asked my father to, uh, to write some music for The Prisoner. And, and Pat McGoon was one of those people who knew what he didn't want, but he couldn't very really explain what he did want. And, you know, bless him. And so my father came up with an idea and Pat McGoon said, no, that's, I don't want that. And my father sat down and said, have you got any ideas? Can you point me in the right direction? And, um, and he said, uh, well, I don't know. It's very difficult to explain. So, so they kind of had a little falling out over that because my, my dad didn't suffer fools gladly. And, um, and of course, someone else got the job. The same thing happened with uh, Stanley Kubrick because <laughs> uh, he lived locally in Boreham and he asked m my dad to come in and write music for um, Space Oddity. <laughs> And um, so my father came down and sat in his private cinema room and uh, Kubrick showed him all this wonderful footage of planets and stuff. And he was at the, so at the soundtrack was, of course, Strauss and all these, you know, various bits of music that he'd put, just pasted up. And, uh, and my father had asked Kubrick, um, what sort of thing do you want? And, and Kubrick could say, well, I got something a bit like this. And my father said, well, why don't you use that? <laughs> And completely talked himself out of a job, so there you go. But Kubrick was another one of those who didn't really know what he wanted, you know. So I think there are, there are plenty of very artistic people who, who are great at knowing how to do their jobs, but as soon as you take them out of that environment and give them a, a, something else to do, they're, they're a, bit, a little bit at sea. <laughs> My father had quite strong views about records being released because he felt if you'd written a nice theme and it's got to last for a year or two years on a TV series, then it's no good having a hit single with it because people would be tired of it after a month. So I think he kind of shied away a little from um, pushing things to be released as records. He did make a lovely record with Ken Jones, which was The Saint Meets Danger Man or Danger Man Meets The Saint where they scored some new versions and, um, and recorded some new versions. Uh, but they were kind of very jazzy orientated. And I think the album, the album came out in America. It did, it did OK, actually. Of course, my dad did Bronco Lane with Ty Harding as well, didn't he? Which um, I remember him taking me to meet Ty Harding. He was staying at the Hilton in Park Lane. I was so impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gideon's Way. Um, I remember the, the pipes and whistles that he kind of put together for it. and I. I think I went to the recording of that as well. Can't remember where it was. Later years for theme tunes, he was using um, AdVision Studios and actually using multi-track. The first session I ever went to, which was probably um, a Robin Hood session or maybe even a Buccaneer session, um, he, if he wanted to hear anything back, they had to run a, a, a disc, an acetate at the same time. And then he'd come back in the control room and they'd play the acetate to him to see if they got the, the balance right of the, um, of the instruments. That was the only way of hearing anything back because they were recording to optical. Then um, certainly the, uh, within Danger Man and the Saint, they were recording to mag, 35 mil mag, so that's quite easy to play back, but not, not a multi-track as such. And then when multi-track came along, I think he was quite keen to, to use it, but none of the film studios had it, so he had to use a recording studio, um, an AdVision or um, the one at Wembley. CTS, I think, were probably the two that he used. Nice rooms as well, N nice live rooms rather than um, kind of sound stagey rooms. What's the one I went? Department S. That was multi-track, and I went to this. That was at that was at AdVision, and um, I wrote the left hand for that. <laughs> <laughs> My dad liked other people to write the left hand. I had an organ, and he heard me mucking around with do 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 do, 
and uh, he nicked it off me, the bugger. Brandon Hocker, yeah, I went to the filming of quite a few of those um, at uh, Elstree, and I was at school and I managed to organise a school trip to meet Randall and Hopkirk and to watch a little bit of filming going on. And they explained, they explained to me in great detail how they stopped the camera and move Hopkirk and, um, and then start the camera again. And of course, um, Randall in the meantime has moved a couple of feet and switched and and that's why you've got these incredible jumps in the in the film. I just it's so funny watching it now, isn't it? Because it's it's like, wow, that's clever. No. <laughs> Going back to the, the, uh, the harpsichord, yes, I mean, everybody loved the Danger Man theme and probably someone suggested, why don't you use a, a harpsichord again? He did buy a harpsichord at, at home and, um, and used it for composing on sometimes. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a great machine. And they go out of tune so much, so easily. It's, uh, it's com he's constantly looking at. It's, um, I think that the Danger Man was recorded on a Goebbels harpsichord, which was lo a lovely instrument. But I can't remember the Randall and Hockwell. Probably the same machine from, uh, I think they were made just outside Oxford. Six episodes will probably be six sessions, maybe two sessions a day. So yeah, three days, three days for six episodes. Which doesn't seem a lot. He seems to be in the studio a lot more than that. Um, the theme... The theme I think he would ponder about quite a lot um, at home until he hit on something and, he, and it was a bit of a eureka moment I think when, when he comes come to a theme tune and he'd worry a lot about whether it was commercial or too commercial or he didn't want to get into that pop era and he wanted to stay away from but he wanted something that was different that would make people listen and a, and a signature tune is a signature tune it's, it's for you to go ah here's the saint or here's Danger Man. And, um, so yeah, he he would wonder, worried about worry and wonder about that. But of course, as soon he because he wrote from his head, he'd be able to go. That's yeah, I've got that. Okay, fine. And he'd score it and put it down, and that would probably take about an hour. You know, it's a thirty-second piece, isn't it? Really, it's not going to take forever. Well, you used to read the scripts for doing the scoring, and he used to have meetings where they would decide where the background music was going to fit in the first six episodes, and. He'd probably score, he'd probably write those in within probably two weeks, I would say. Pretty quick. One day he turned up for a recording and he didn't recognise any of the musicians at all. Up until then he'd always had the same fixer and the same fixer had always had the same faces. And some of them were really old friends. Um, there was a, a horn player, Jimmy Buck, who was very famous, who played with orchestras and he, he played on the Robin Hood fanfares and... Uh, so, and that, that, and he had two friends who were also with orchestras and, um, you know, London Symphony Orchestra or something. And so they were obviously top players and, um, and they were part of the sound of the Robin Hood, the three horn players. That, that was very, very important to him. And, and they stayed in touch. He, he always had the same guitarist who was um, a jazzer, so F hole guitar. Um, can't remember his name. Um, now, bass, bass players, that was quite funny, because he had Herbie Flowers one day. And uh, I remember about a month later, he tried to get Herbie Flowers, and he joined T-Rex. So, uh, so that, that had gone out the window. So, yeah, musicians did come and go a bit. But, um, 
there was a day when he turned up and he didn't recognise a single face in the studio and, and, the, and the fixer was saying to him, you know, the fixer is the guy who books all the musicians, he said to my dad, don't worry, it'll be fine. And my dad was going, well, I don't know any of these people at all. You know. So they started to record and it wasn't very good. And my dad got quite agitated about it, took the fixer to one side and said, what's going on? Anyway, it all came out that they were, um, they were part of a, a sect as such. <laughs> And everybody was doing everybody a favour. It was a bit like Rotary Club, but not quite, you know. <laughs> Bert Elms we saw socially. He was he was Uncle Bert actually to me, and um, and he lived very close by, and, and we uh, we did see him socially. I can't remember who else worked with Dad, but um, there, it wasn't a, it wasn't a competition thing. I think he was just very glad to be part of the of the whole setup. You know, it, it, it's not just the composer. It's the it's the it's the guys who are doing the, the arrangements, it's the orchestrators, it's the, um, the music editor is, is very, very important in these series because they only used to score six series and then there would be 13 made. And so the music editor then had to go through all the scored music and find suitable pieces, um, which, was, which is out of control in my father's hands, to find something suitable to fit into the other seven episodes. It was, a, it was quite a close unit. I think everybody was uh, pretty on the ball and knew what they were doing. In fact, when I was at college, my father took me to um, Elstree to meet one of the music editors because I, I was making a film at the time at college and he, um, he helped me lift off the soundtrack and get it re-synced into to film because I'd lost all the sync. So that was, that was rather nice, yeah. Well, after we met Pete Townsend, they, they talked about home studios and they used to have little banks of reboxes that, and they'd start them all together so they had kind of like multi-track and one would slowly go out of time. But if you're writing a minute piece of music, it's actually a, a good way to, to produce a demo. And then he bought synthesizers. Um, he's one of the first people in, in Britain to start using synthesizers and he bought um, the BCS3 from Putney, the, um, the company that was down there. And... Um, and then he bought an ARP later, and, and yeah, he was quite into home, making little demos at home and everything. When he was later on, when he um, he was doing string arrangements, and he bought he had actually bought Fairlights by then. He would actually, he this is in the 70s. He would, and he was asked by people like Glyn Johns, who produced the Eagles, and um, and one or two other people to do um, and Pete Townsend to do string arrangements for rock. Productions and rock, and rec rock, you know rock recordings and um, pop recordings and um, he was always a little bit off the wall so people never quite knew what they were going to get with him. <laughs> he would never he would never play a pad you know it was it was it was going to be something like something very intricate and the musician for the musicians to get their heads around no doubt but um, he would make little demos at home when he was doing these so that the the, um, the producer or the artist could come around and have a little listen or you did send him a tape of the demo of the string arrangement which is quite fun I don't think anybody else was doing it in those days it's a, of course it's quite natural nowadays yeah apparently um, my father fell out with um, was it Monty Bowen yeah um, over not producing something that was a hit and I'm shying away from being having a commercial success for the reasons that Pop record has a, a very short shelf life, and, and a theme tune needs to go on for two, three years, or even longer. And um, it would always sound, if you had a hit, hit with a theme tune, it would always sound horrible um, a year later. I think, um, I think the Aven that happened to the Avengers, I think, didn't it? Yeah. Everybody kind of went, ooh, write another one. But anyway, Laurie, Laurie Johnson got, got the nod and came in and did the, um, the offshoot to Department S which was called Jason King. 
But uh, my dad is still doing. We're still right. We're still working with the the same group of people. Though, and um, although he he kind of got taken off writing theme tunes and bits, because didn't he? Because the um, the next Roger Moore series, the Persuaders, he was given um, the background music to do, I believe, but uh, not the theme. And I think it happened onto something else as well. I think he stopped working um, for a number of reasons. I think the action series did start to fall off and people wanted more drama and less of this um, smack bang kind of pow type of uh, program, type of series. And at the same time, um, he did get offers to do stuff with TV companies, and but he was very strong-minded in that he would never ever um, give his publishing away. And when Yorkshire TV came to him in the 70s and asked him to score a new series, um, they wanted to control the publishing, and he just said no. So I think he, so times were changing a lot for, that, for, the, for those sort of people and doing that sort of job. And uh, he, had, he was quite uh, strong-minded about it. He didn't have to worry. I mean, the, the money, money, you know, financially, he was fine um, for the rest of his life. Um, and especially with feature films, like, I mean, the Saint feature film, he, you know, was started early in the late 90s, wasn't it, I think? And uh, when was it made? I think it was made at the end of the 90s. But that, you know, things like that always brought in enough money for, to keep him in that in the way he was accustomed anyway. Also, um, the studios started to be a little bit more money driven and they probably got very expensive to make those sort of things. And then there was also the breakup of the group um, who were making them all. You know, people were going different ways and, um, and um, or, or retiring or whatever. And so Monty Berman probably just packed it in, I think, you know, along with most of the, um, the people that were around him at the time. Also, the, if, to make a film, which my father obviously didn't have a name for doing, um, to make a film had a much longer, bigger return. I think it was quite hard work to sell a 13 series to America by the 70s, whereas in the 60s it, it seemed to be quite an easy thing to do. don't remember where, but I remember him talking about meeting Lou and, um, and the grades, the whole family, I think. So they must have got together socially at some point, yeah. North London boys again, I expect. <laughs> Danger Man theme was not just wasn't just his favourite, but you know Jules Holland plays it live, and a lot of people have picked up on it because it's got a it's got a kind of a bit of a feel good to it. Everybody everybody recognises the Saint. The Saint was a great signature, but um, the Danger Man theme as a piece of music was quite unique. Nobody used a harpsichord before as a theme to play a theme tune on, you know. So um, it was quite. But he was, he was always looking for new sounds, like the Saint, as I said before, is, is, a, is a girl's voice and a flute and something else all played in unison. Cause he, and that's why he liked synthesizers so much, because suddenly he could find a new sound. And he was always looking for those sort of unique sounds to try and blend them into a theme. But he still, of course, his, his roots were still in big band and brass, and when, of course, the Baron came along, the big band brass thing all came back. He, he tried to write for what, what, for the character, I suppose. And when you get things like um, Gideon's Way, it's a bit like a policeman's kind of jaunty. It's a kind of jaunty thing. It's it's very London sounding. It's got whistles and um, flutes in it, and it's a kind of a bit of a pipe arrangement. You know, it's got that sort of military air to it, and that's kind of the character who, that, that was that was in the series. So he, he was always looking for that sort of aspect, I think, to look at. I remember sitting down and watching um, Ivanhoe with him and getting quite excited. I think Robin Hood we just took as a pinch of salt because he didn't write them. He didn't write the tune. Hey, Dad, he didn't write the tune. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't aware that there was any snobbery involved, but I suppose in later years you kind of think, oh, yes, maybe there was a bit of that going on with film composers being the artists and TV composers not being... But um, 
But, I, you know, I mean, my father did get offers to go and work in, in, uh, in Hollywood and turn them down. And so, uh, but I think he was so highly thought of at the time, it didn't really seem to matter to him. He, he just loved the, the, the whole medium of television and the quick turnaround and, you know, the buzz, I think, of working so quickly. An episode was being made in, in four or five days, I think, you know, in those days, which was quite fantastic. You know. He did have a great time, but he was a workaholic as well. I've noticed that I'm turning into my dad's workaholic thing where I even get coming into the studio at weekends and start to fiddle. And uh, I've had to keep, keep sort of watch it and keep control on it because um, my mum, I remember my mum did, did complain about the amount of time he was uh, locked away in writing, you know. But it was rather nice because even if we went on holiday, we had a house in, in, on the south coast and he had a room with the piano in so he could, if we disappeared there for the whole summer, he would. Um, He'd always write and rush back to London to record the odd thing. He was very, very, very dedicated. I think that's probably what I should leave you with. He was, he was very, very dedicated in trying to do the best job he possibly could. And he put a lot of time and effort into it. Sometimes to the detriment of the family, but that didn't, didn't seem to matter. <laughs>